I am so thrilled as we begin uh, John's Gospel. Now let me just back, uh, catch you up on who John is. John is born in 10 A.D. in Bethsaida. Now folks, this is John who we're going to call John the Apostle. This is not John the Baptist who in this very first chapter we're going to be dealing with it. So I'm going to be calling them the Apostle or the Baptist. You got it? If I'm talking about John the Baptist, I'm talking about John's cousin, I mean Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Um, Mary, uh, this is John the Baptist that Mary goes to tell Elizabeth about she's going to bear a child and John is in Elizabeth's womb and, and leaps inside of her womb. Now John the Gospel doesn't tell us that. We have to go get that in the, in the Gospel of Luke. But that, we've got two Johns here we're dealing with. There's actually a third John, but we don't really have to worry about him right now in the story. So we're talking about the apostle. He's born in 10 AD. He is 17 years old in June or July, either middle to late June, real early in July. And since they didn't celebrate the 4th of July, it's probably okay if it happened on that day, on a holiday. Jesus comes. Do what? What did you say? Somebody said something? How, we'll let it slide this time, that's right. Fourth uh, of July to maybe the 10th, Jesus comes down to the Jordan River and there he is baptized by John the Baptist and this John, John the Apostle, he's not an apostle yet, he sees Jesus being baptized at the Jordan River because John, this John who is going to become the apostle, is already a follower of and a believer in the message that John the Baptist is proclaiming that the Messiah is coming. Repent and be baptized and be part of this new swing in, in, uh, in faith. And John has bought into it. Andrew has bought into it. Peter has bought into it. Uh, James has bought into it. Jo this John has a brother by the name of James. They're called the sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder. Now you've heard that when you were growing up with the little stories. So James and John are the sons of Zebedee. This is the son. He is the youngest of the apostles. In fact, the apostles will go up. Of the twelve apostles, Jesus didn't select them all in the same age range. Jesus selected them, selected them because of who they were. And this apostle, John, is um, uh, uh, 17. But we get all over to Matthew, the tax collector. Matthew was probably older than Jesus was probably much older than Jesus. So we've got a big wide range. All right. So Jesus, John sees John the Baptist baptize Jesus in June to July of AD 27. John, actually, John the Baptist actually starts his ministry in February of AD 27. All right. Now, in August of AD 27, Jesus has already been in the wilderness for 40 days. He's gotten hungry after the 40 days are over and he's already been tempted by the devil in three different areas and the last temptation happens in Jerusalem on the pinnacle of the temple. From that, Jesus then goes and he goes back out to where John is baptizing and John, the apostle, sees Jesus. John the Baptist says, Hey, look, there he is, this John with Andrew, then begin to follow Jesus in August of A.D. 27. In April of A.D. 30, this John, who writes this letter, is at the cross with Mary. Jesus looks down at him and asks him to take care of his mother, Mary. John will care for her until she dies in the city of Ephesus, and by the way, this John also will die in Ephesus, and he is the only apostle of the twelve that dies a natural death. All the other eleven, and Paul too, counting the twelve, other twelve apostles who hold that name and that title, die a martyr's death for their faith. By the way, John's brother James is the first to die. John's brother James is the first to die. Uh, after, uh, and we saw that in the book of Acts. All right. I didn't write it in here, but I ought to. In A.D. 68, 
By A.D. 68, Jude writes his letter, that little 24-verse letter, and when Jude writes that letter in A.D. 68, all the New Testament Scripture is finished except for what John is going to write. In 90, A.D. 90, that's 22 years later, John finally picks up the pen and he writes the Gospel. And then four years later, he writes 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And then a year after that, he writes the Revelation. The following year, John dies a natural death in Ephesus. So we are 22 years after the last scripture was written. And what John is doing, he is writing to fill in the gaps in the gospel that Matthew, Mark, and Luke omitted. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were really only privy to Jesus' Galilean ministry. And you remember that? I told you that when we were studying the book of Mark. They write, uh, well, let's take it back. They write about his birth, and they write about the Galilean ministry, and they write about the Passion. Now, the Passion includes Jesus, everything that happens in Jesus' last week on earth uh, while he's still ministering. He comes down from Galilee and through Judea. What happens at the Lord's Supper, what happens with his triumphal entry, what happens at Calvary, that's called the Passion. When he raises from the grave, that's, called the, that's all the Passion of Christ and ascends into the air. That's all the Passion of Christ. John is going to write for us about the Judean ministry of Jesus and the Passion of Christ. Had it not been for John, we would have lost and never known about 18 months of Jesus' three-year ministry. We just wouldn't have known about it. Uh, there are a few places where we could pick it up in the other letters of Peter and James and, and um, half-brother Jesus and, 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 and Paul, but really we would have never gotten the whole picture. <clears throat> so because of that, I'm doing for you in this, in this gospel lesson exactly what we did when we did Acts. You know, as we went through with Acts, when the book of Matthew is written, I told you, here's where the book of Matthew is written, and this is the reason why it's written. When Mark was written, here's, and you remember last week I ended up <clears throat> by telling you the story of all the, the books uh, that were written after Acts was over and written during the prison ministry and all that. I'm going to do the similar same thing here whenever we go through. In fact, if you'll look on page, I think it's page four of your notes, you'll see there's a chart there. That chart is where I am going over to Matthew, Mark, and Luke and filling in the gaps that John leaves out. And I will do that through the entire lesson as we're going through the next 10 weeks. And that's how long it will take us to get, get through the book of John. I will fill in the gaps and you will have a wonderful picture of the entire three-year ministry. So with that, John opens his gospel letter... 60 years after the death and the passion of Christ. It's been 60 years, and he has opened it just almost like Moses opens up the book of Genesis, and John opens it up like he's going to open up 1 John. Those of you who were with us Wednesday night when Stuart started 1 John, it's going to be a great study. Don't miss Stuart on that. He, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, John opens that letter in almost the same way he opens this letter. It's, he just makes the statement and the fact that God is God. He has existed from all time. He will continue to exist for all time. No beginnings, no ends. He's just God. John does not explain him away. He doesn't explain him into being. He doesn't explain anything. He just assumes that God is God and that God from the very beginning has been the Word of God. And that doesn't mean a lot to us as we're going through here. In fact, we could spend a lot of time on it. But when we get on down into the letter, we'll, we'll catch on at the teachings of Jesus as John records them that from the very beginning when God was creating, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was creating the wor world, He did it by speaking it into being. He said, let there be and it happened. Now folks, miracles happen today the same way. Whenever we pray for someone to get healed, 
All God does is says, let it be. And it's done. And that person gets healed miraculously here on earth. God is in control of that. And we've seen those things happen. We've seen where they've, they've given, you know, I'm thinking about a person right now that was given 90, 90 days to live um, uh, no matter what. He's only going to live 90 days, but they're going to go ahead and do, this, do the surgery to relieve the pain. So they do the surgery to relieve the pain. They take out the affected area. And then lo and behold, they come back and they start trying to do radiation and everything. They look at it and say, well, well wait a minute, mercy, you know, that's, that, that, that's fixed. And the next thing you know, uh, he has passed all the treatments of that, uh, uh, for that disease that, that we have available to us. And now he's six years past those treatments. And the doctors have said to him, keep checking. They're saying, uh, you know, you're a guinea pig because we, nev we had never had anyone else live through the treatment, the first treatment program. And in fact, he's a member of this class. He's a member of this class who went through a treatment and was not supposed to live but 90 days to a year at the most and now he is six years past the treatments and it's a miracle folks just a miracle and he's got a great report every time he goes to a great report and they keep trying to do things to him to to make sure he stays in the same situation but he keeps getting a great report and I folks I just want to tell you I think what happened is that the Lord said let it be and it was Yes, he allowed the doctors to take it out, and then he said, okay, we've done that. Now let's now watch the miracle of how I can work in this person's life and see the ministry that's happened in this person's life that's in our class today. So he just simply starts out by, by proclaiming the truth about the established God. And here he starts, one one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word. He spoke it into being. He spoke the world in the beginning. By the way, we know at the end, in the book of Revelation, he just simply speaks it out of being too. You realize that? He just says, okay, it is done. And he changes everything in the twinkling of an eye into a sinless, pure, untaintable world at that point in time where no one can ever sin again. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is no a God. There is no the God in there. It's just He was God. The Word is God. He is everlasting. He's just making a statement in this prologue. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, He created it all. There is nothing in this world that He did not create. He created it, and then we're going to find out that He came to be the Savior of it too. What fitting response for the God who created it to also be the Savior of it because He's the only one who can come to you and present to you a plan of salvation that will put you in His graces so that you can approach Him, the Holy God. Looking on, in Him was life, and it, by the way, no, none of us come to life without Him. None of us have life. The fact of the matter is, is nothing out there in the world has life without Him. He breathed His Spirit into everything, and everything that lives has life because the Spirit of God is causing it to have life. Even the leaf on a tree has life because the Spirit of God is in it to give it life. The interesting thing about that is, He only really had to create it one time. He only created it one time. Think about this. He took Adam, he took dirt, and he formed it into a man, and he leaned over and he breathed into it the breath of life or the spirit of life. Breath and spirit, same word. He breathed into it. Adam began to live. He then took from that living being a rib from his side and formed a woman. So from something that he had already given life, he created something with life, and the woman was created. And from that came along all the little children. And whether you like it or not, you need to look at the person standing behind you, sitting behind you, in front of you, and you realize we all are family. Not a single one of us was created outside and around Adam and Eve. We're all related. Yes, you take away the zest, 
and the hair products and all that, and we all smell alike and we stink alike and we all got the same problems that everybody has because we all, life all comes from. Life is passed on through the next child until as in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 5 through 7, God decides to take it, take that life that he has given to us away from us he then, our body goes in the ground and returns to the dust from which it came. The Spirit of God who gives us life returns to God because it belongs to God and only God controls it. And then the soul of man goes to his eternal home, one place or the other. Do you, you, know, you got it? Okay. You either go up or you go down. In fact, for those of you who want to do a little evangelism, when you get into an elevator, that's a great way to do it. When you get in the elevator and you punch the down button, and somebody's in the elevator with you say, hmm, you're going down? I am too. But eternally, in the long run, I'm going up. They go, huh? No, I'm going down the first floor. I say, I know. I'm going the first floor too. But really, I want to go up. And they go, oh, I know what you mean. And they say, yeah. Do you know, are you ready to go up? Oh, yeah, I'm ready to go up. Well, that happened this past week in the hospital with me. And they said, no, I don't believe in that stuff. I said, oh, we got to talk about that. <laughs> See, I ain't got time to talk. Oh, I wish you did. And so I told her just a moment, what, what Jesus had done in my life so I could get ready to go up. Well, I don't know what has ever happened to her, but I laid the seed. Somebody else will harvest that seed because she had to run, but I hope she thinks about it. So, his, his, life comes from God. When a tree falls, a leaf falls off of a tree and dies and is plucked, plucked away from that life-giving thing that's out there, I, I, it dies because it's cut off from the thing that the Lord had given life to. I looked out and the magnolia trees are blossoming this, at this time of year. And I get to thinking, how does it know to make blooms and blossoms? How does it know to do that? I look at the rose bushes in our front yard. How does it know to make roses instead of just leaves? And the truth is, there's not a person out here of us can make it, make a rose or, or a blossom. We just have to nurture it and add stuff to it and keep it watered and stuff like that so that the life can feed it to continue to grow. You don't know what's going to blossom. You know what's going to blossom. You just don't know when it's going to blossom, but it's going to blossom in the right time. By the way, that's the same thing we, we do with y'all in your life. All we can do is feed you in your life so that you will blossom at the right time. And that's God's doing to make you blossom because I can't make you blossom. Look up. All life comes from God and life was the, and the life was the light of men. <laughs> Who's the life? The life that everybody lives and has comes from the Lord Jesus and then he decides to come as the light of men. Why does he come at the light, as the light of men? He, he's the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Oh, by the time Jesus came, the world was dark. You think it's dark now? It was dark then. The Jewish faith that was formed in the wilderness uh, when they came out of Egypt by the time Jesus came, did not even really resemble the Jewish faith of the wilderness except with the temple and the ornaments and the, and the vessels, the man-made, the, the things that were used because all the laws by that time and all the rituals that were in place were all man-made by that time. Started off right with good intentions, but then... Um, went sour and went sour bad. You know what that is? I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, we can, we can draw a straight line like when you're laying a foundation and you, you shoot that line over there and you say, okay, that's where we want that line to be. Well, if you happen to get that off just a little bit, just a little bit, it'll finally start going off track. And see, that's the problem that happened in the Jewish faith. They just got a little off track. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. And then they got a little more off track. Well, it's not, and nobody squeals foul until they get way off track. And by the way, the further you get off the straight line and the narrow path, the more bitter you are towards the straight path. I'll give you an example. A lady comes from California, is transferred by her company to Houston. She works a little less than a month. And on Monday, two weeks ago, she shows up to go to work. And there's a chain on the door and a note that says that the company has been seized by the IRS with a phone number of who to call 
if uh, to find out more information. She didn't bring anything when she came from the other state. She is half a country, half the way across America, away from her, her home and her family. And here she is with nothing. So she goes to her church. And her church says, we'll pray for you, but we can't help you. And by the way, you know we've got this seminar coming up this weekend. And we want you to go, and so would you pay your $100? So thinking that she's doing the right thing, in the seminar she pays her $100 to go to the work. But she doesn't have a job. And she needs to get back home. She pays her money and then she realizes everything's falling apart and she's struggling and she's going to this other church, by the way, in this area. And I'm not going to tell you who it is because I don't want to bruise what's going on. So I'm changing the story just a little bit, but I'm not changing what I'm fixing to say to you. Uh, she ends up over here at Sagemont because some of the people that she's met have said, well, maybe Sagemont can help you since your own home church can't help you. So all she needs is a $125 ticket to get her on a bus to get her back to her hometown. And so uh, finally she gives me a, she's going to give me a phone call, but she waits to give that phone call. And she finally calls me and she says, you know, I've got that seminar this weekend and, and if, you know, I just hate, not to go to it. I've already paid for it. I said, you ought to go. Go to that seminar. That's your home church. She says, but I feel like I ought to come to y'all's church. I said, ma'am, I said, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter at all. If it's $125, it's $125 get you home where your family can take care of you. If your home church doesn't have that money to take care of you, I understand that. Let's see what we can do to help you get on back and get on your feet. So she goes to the seminar. They said, we missed you last week. Where were you? And they said, oh, I went and visited Sagemont on Wednesday night and on Sunday. And then I talked to Dr. Hastings over there uh, last Monday. And he told me I ought to come up. And they said, I'll tell you what, since you've already been to Sagemont, you can't stay for the seminar. They didn't let her stay. We don't want to have anything to do with people who are having to do with that Sagemont church over there. That offends you, doesn't it? Now let me tell you what's interesting. That church that we're talking about is not a split off from Sagemont. But it is a split off from Southern Baptist. Where a, where a man years ago got sideways with the doctrines and the teachings that we hold and he was just a little off, just a little bit, and he got off. And then the real problem came when he left and the next pastor came in that had been sitting in the pew and he developed some more rules and regulations and he got a little further off and began taking the church way off and right now they're way off from us. All with man-made laws. The grace of God has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation in this church. What matters in this church that I'm talking about is, is you will only find salvation as evidenced by speaking in a, another language that is unintelligible to everyone else. That is the only way you can know that you're saved. And by the way, also, if you attend any church besides their church or church in their denomination, you are not even Christian and you are not saved. You see how we get off the boat and get off the sign, get everything off? That's exactly what happened to Judaism. And by the time Jesus comes, Judaism is so far off the track that they need a Savior, and they need the Messiah to come. we got a long way to go and a short time to get there, don't we? <laughs> verse 5, verse 6. Well, John, it's time for John the Baptist to show up. It's time for John the Baptist. There came a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify about the light. One of John's fav John the Apostle's favorite word topics is Jesus being the light. We're going to see it three or four times before we end this gospel. He came, he came to be a witness to testify about the light. He's, John is talking about John the Baptist who came, whose purpose was to testify that the light is coming, the light is coming to, to shine on the darkness, on those who've gone astray and gone off track, and to bring them back on track. And he says he comes not as the light, but he came to testify of the light. In other words, John the Baptist is not the light, but he's going to share, he's going to share that the light is coming. And he's going to, when the light shows up, he's going to say, that is him. That's the light. So there was a true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. A true light. 
a light that is faithful and is accurate. And it's coming into this world to shed light on all the darkness of everyone who's gotten off track. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. So John in AD 90 is making reference to Jesus' ministry in 27, 28, 29, 30 and his death and the world. And when he's talking about the world, he is really talking about Jewishness. Jewish people did not know him even though they knew him. They saw him grow up. They saw him in the temple at age 12. They saw him. They knew who he was because he went to the temple every year. He sat there and talked with them. This was not a stranger to them. When they pursued him to kill him, he was not a stranger. They knew him. They knew about him. They were too close to the story of him being born in a manger and the shepherds coming and the magi coming, the, the, the wise men coming and the angels descending and all that happening there in Bethlehem. They knew about all that. They had heard about it. In fact, out of the Sanhedrin records we have uh, still today that I have showed you many times and they're over in that, in that uh, study in the Gospel of Luke that we did where we actually pull the record they sent reporters to those shepherds who went to visit Jesus and asked them how to know how they knew to go and talk, go and find Jesus. They sent reporters who talked about did they see the angels and they talked to these people about the angels they saw and about everything that happened and they brought those reports back to the Sanhedrin and we have those records. But the world did not accept their testimony. And neither do they want to, they, neither do they want to really accept the true uh, testimony of Jesus Christ. They do not know Him. Verse 11. So He came to His own. Who is His own? Jews. He came to His Jewish heritage. And those who were His own did not receive Him. Didn't want Him. No. He came to be their Messiah. You see, in the law of Moses and, the, and, the, and, the, and Moses' writing and the prophet's writings, they proclaim how Jesus would come and Jesus came exactly that way as the Messiah. But they had gotten off track and they were looking for a victorious king, Messiah, who would come and take over Rome and take over everybody. But that's not what's in, in the law of Moses. That's not what's in the prophets. Jesus came exactly like it was prophesied for Him to come. But they had rewritten history so that they were looking for the, raw, the person to come the wrong way. They didn't want to accept Jesus when He came. <laughs> but as many as received Him, He gave them the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Born. They'd already been born in this world and all they had to do was say, I put my trust in that Messiah. And now they're born of God. Topic's going to come up with Nicodemus in chapter 3. So John is getting us ready for us to talk about the light, talk about the rejection of the Jews, talk about being born again. He's just telling us, he's putting all these things in this prologue. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus comes as God and He puts on the flesh of a babe in 4 B.C. Not A.D., B.C. In doing that, He doesn't say, okay, Mary's going to have a child with Joseph and it's going to be a baby, so I'm going to go into that baby and I'm going I'm, I'm to come from being God and go into that baby they're already going to have. That's not the way it happens. God doesn't go into a man who's already uh, going to be on its way or to a baby. No. No. Mary and Joseph had never come together in a relationship and so God had to create Himself in the flesh inside of Mary's womb. It's the miraculous part about it. God recreated Himself in the room and took on the flesh to be born like any other person. He didn't do it through someone who was already on the way. He comes as the only begotten. And by the way, every single uh, faith, uh, false religion and cult, false religion and cult, every single one of them do not understand the word begotten. They define the word begotten to be the first created. That when God was doing the creation, 
The first thing he did was he created Jesus, his son. And then Jesus, his son, created everything else. That's how they interpret this. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, Adventists, some of the Adventist groups, just go on down the line with them, okay? They all look at it that way. But the problem is, is the word that is used here is the word, and I hate to use Greek words because it just kind of flies over our heads, but the word is monogenous. It means a lone family. When he's talking about him being begotten and the only begotten of the Father, it says that, that he is one, mono, one, one, mono, with. He is one in family with. That is that battle that happened at the Council of Nicaea when Constantine pulled them together and said, I want you to determine the nature of Christ. Is he created or is he not created? And the outcome was that was signed by 300 and something of the pastors. No, he was not created. He was monogenous. He was one in unity with God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is not dealt with at that point in time. The Holy Spirit will come up in another conference where they will say, no, He is monogenous. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one in unity. It's not birthed from, proceeded from. Christianity believes that He proceeded from, that He was one in, that He was not the first cre uh, creation. Here's where the problem with that. You might ask me the question, okay, Let's just say that I believe that Christ was the first creation and He was created, He created everything else and then he, became, and he was the Messiah. He was created to be the Messiah. And I put my faith and trust in Him. Is there anything wrong with that? The truth of the matter is, is what matters is, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Okay? Then you will put your trust in the rest of the story about Him. The issue never comes in that first one who may think that way. The issue comes down the road. Because that's the same issue that happened in the Mormonism with Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith never taught that Jesus was the first created. That, I'm mean, sorry, I take that back. Joseph Smith did teach that, Joseph Smith, uh, that Jesus was the first created. When Joseph Smith lost its reins and was taken over by Brigham Young, Brigham Young then comes in and says, Oh yes, Jesus was the first created, and Brigham Young adds to the theology, and Lucifer was the second created, so Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. Now you see the falseness coming away a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. So now... Jesus, uh, Lucifer is not simple, or Satan is not an angel that Jesus has created. God created Lucifer and he's on an equal par with Jesus. Now we got a problem. And as this theology spins on out, it gets further and further away from the straight line truth that Jesus came to proclaim. All right. So, the truth comes in grace and truth. Verse 15, and John testified about him and cried out saying, this is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So th when Jesus comes, he brings grace and truth. But the law was given through Moses. And Moses and the prophets point towards Jesus who is bringing about grace. You do not have salvation and grace in your life by the way you do something plus something else. By you buying into the grace of God and then having to do something else. If you don't, you don't get your salvation by saying, Okay, I'm saved by the grace of God and by how, how well I give money to the temple or the two turtle doves that I present, or the, or, 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 uh, the, um, the way that I um, uh, come and spend time in worship. None of that has to do with your salvation. Your salvation is a free gift of God. You just trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not onto your own understanding. And He will give you that grace, and He will give you salvation. So the world doesn't realize that. And, most, and John is saying that this John the Baptist testified that Jesus was coming 
just as Moses the prophet had, had declared. Well, verse 18 says, and goes on with John says, And no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. In other words, that John the Baptist is coming and, and giving the testimony, and when Jesus gets here, Jesus has explained Him. John the, ba John the Apostle is actually talking about Jesus, has explained Himself, and over in John chapter 14, Jesus will have a discourse where He says, No one has ever seen the Father. But if you're looking at me, you're seeing me, you're seeing the Father because I am the representation, exact representation of God, the Father in everything. Everything about me is God the Father. He came, He is God, and He came. Well, at this point, John leaves out some of the narrative of what happens in Jesus' life. If you go, here's, my, here's our first little chart here. Matthew includes the genealogy from Abraham to, to Joseph, who's the adopted father of Jesus. Luke includes the genealogy from Adam to Mary, <laughs> all the way through Eli, her father, or Heli with an H, or Eli, which is E-L-I, -E all the way to Jesus. So we've got the two genealogies, so we know how all that works. Uh, over in Luke, we've got the, and I'll just read these really quick for you, We've got uh, Gabriel announces the birth of, G of John the Baptist. Then Gabriel visits Mary to tell her of the pregnancy, of her pregnancy. And then Mary visits Elizabeth, where John, John the Baptist's mother, where John's going to leap in her womb when, when she hears her coming and tells the story about her pregnancy. And the angel visits Joseph in a dream to tell him of Jesus' birth. And then Jesus is born in Bethlehem sometime between January and March of 4 B.C., and then the shepherds come to visit Jesus in the manger, and the wise men bring gifts to Jesus in the manger. Then he's circumcised on the eighth day of life. Jesus is presented in the temple, and Joseph's family finally escapes over to Egypt because Herod has made a decree to kill all the infant boys. And the Israel children feel Herod's wrath sometime between March and April of 4 B.C. Herod dies in April of 4 B.C. So Joseph returns with his family from Egypt and goes and settles in Nazareth in 4 B.C. Then we skip to 12 years to where Jesus is seen in the temple in A.D. 8. And then we hear about the ministry of John the Baptist, which begins, and there's a wrong date there. The date is actually right in the next one. Begins in February of A.D. 27. John doesn't tell us that stuff because the other three gospel writers have. So John just skips it and goes on in and he says, this is the testimony of John. We're telling you the testimony of John the Baptist here. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed that, and, and did not deny but confessed, I am not the Christ. Are you the Christ? I'm sure they ask him. He says, no, I'm not the Christ. Absolutely, I'm not the Christ. No, I, I'm not him. John did not make any pretenses about who he was. He just didn't even tell him he was anybody like that. In fact, they go on down, they ask him in verse 21, they said, Then what? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not Elijah. Although, when we get on down in, John, in this book, we're going to find out that Jesus says, John, Eli, John the Baptist, he was the Elijah of Malachi's prophecy. He was the one who was coming in the spirit of Elijah. In fact, he dressed like Elijah. He smelt like Elijah. He ate food like Elijah did. And he was like Elijah. And when they ask him, here, are you a prophet? He says, no, he really was a prophet. He just didn't see him. He's just doing what he was sent to do down at the Jordan River. And they say to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say yourself? And what does John the Baptist do when they ask him? They ask him, tell us what to tell the Pharisees when we get back to the Sanhedrin. And John says, okay, I'll tell you what. Tell them that I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And he says he's not a prophet. He just quoted out of Isaiah chapter 40. And he's telling them that he is the one who's the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah. He at least knows that. His mama and daddy's at least him taught him that. And he's out there. He doesn't, he's not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what's going on. He's just a normal human, human being who's been called of God for a purpose, and that is to set the stage for the Messiah to come. Verse 24. Now they began, uh, they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, and they said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophets? Time out. 
Baptism is not new in Judaism. If you were born a Jew, you never experienced baptism in Judaism. They didn't baptize Jews in Judaism. No. If you were born bread and butter to Jew, you were Jewish from birth and you're Jewish until you die with all the privileges of being a Jew. But if you were a Gentile who was entering into the faith of Judaism, they signified that entrance and changing from Gentile life into Jewish life by baptizing you into the Jewish faith. So they knew what John was doing, but he was baptizing Jewish people. So they said, why are you baptizing Jewish people? You're not baptizing them in the Jewish faith. In fact, he wasn't. He was baptizing them into the repentance of sin. Well, the way you get repentance for sin in Judaism is you bring two turtle doves or a ram or a goat or whatever and you, you offer it on the altar of sacrifice and then you also pay some money in the temple and that's how you get repentance of sin. But John is preaching something new and something different that you get forgiveness of sin by turning your life over to the Messiah who's fixing to come. So he picks up there and he says, uh, John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Do you see what he says there? I'm answering your question. And the one who I am talking about is standing in this crowd with you right now and you don't even recognize him. When Jesus is answering these questions, I mean John is answering these questions, Jesus is right there in the crowd and they don't even know he's the Messiah. They don't recognize him yet. They don't understand who he is. And probably, and I'm just assuming this, Jesus probably came down to the Jordan River and watched his cousin do his ministry for quite a while during that, last, during that six month time. What else did Jesus have to do? He comes down there and he watches and watches everybody come and flock. Because when we get into the gospel, we're going to understand. When we got in, in gospel of Luke, we understood that the whole city's emptied to go and hear what John was having to say over in the Jordan River. Well, verse twenty-eight says these take these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. All right, everybody knows about Bethany. Bethany's a little town on the southeast slope of Mount of Olives, just two miles from, from Jerusalem. It's the wrong Bethany. That Bethany is so far down close, if you go east from that Bethany, you're going to run into the Dead Sea. You have to go north and go up. And in fact, on the other side, on the east side of the Jordan River, was a, is a little town called Bethabara. And by the time of John's writing in 90 AD, the name of that area was called Bethany beyond the Jordan. That's the name that was given to it. Bethany beyond the Jordan. And it picks up its word from Beth. Beth Abara. Okay? Bethany beyond the Jordan. So there's two Bethanies. And so this is not the one. It's just two miles from Jerusalem where Jesus sent the two guys in to get the colt to come for him to ride in on a triumphal entry. That's a different Bethany. And John tells us that. Well, he says, the next day. Okay, one day he's telling them he's standing here among you. And the next day he says, he saw Jesus coming and said to him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he on, on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a, rank, a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. He says, here he is, look here. All you crowd, there he is. This is the one I've been talking about. The day have, had arrived. It's one of these days here uh, in either June or July of, of A.D. 27. And he says, here he is, and he brings him on down. Verse 32 says, and John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of the heaven, and he remained upon him, and I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in the water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on, upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John baptizes with water. Jesus is going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. So the, the scenario is set up, and John doesn't tell us any more about the story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree with this, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke fill in the rest of the information. Jo they, they've already covered it, so John just lists it and appears to it, uh, uh, list it so that we know about it. And so here comes Jesus. He says he showed up, and John would know who he is. He would not really know that he's Messiah yet, but when he sees heaven open and the sending 
coming, uh, the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, and hear the voice of God the Father uh, speaking, saying, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased, which happens over in the other Gospels. John would even know that this is it. But John has a problem with that. John's in prison. Herod's got him over here. He's in prison. He sends word to Jesus later on. He says, Are you really the Messiah? Remember that from Mark? We're going to get to that in this story too. At this point, John does not tell us about the wilderness experience. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us that Jesus is baptized and he immediately goes to the wilderness for 40 days. And in the wilderness, after he ends his time of praying, it, the text says he becomes hungry. After the 40 days is over, he then, when he becomes hungry, Satan comes to him to tempt him three times. And the third temptation is not in the wilderness, by the way. It's on the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. And from there, after Jesus has finally answered correctly and gotten rid of Satan, Jesus goes walking over to see how John is doing. And I think that's where we pick up here in verse 35. It says again the next day. I don't think it's the next day. I think in John's memory from over the 60 years, I think this is the next day after he comes out of the wilderness, that John was standing with the two disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold the Lamb. And two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Here we are. We're in August of A.D. 27, and two disciples follow him. And as Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? They wanted to go where Jesus was going. That is a fitting thing for all of us. We want to go where Jesus is going. They go and they find it. And, and, and he said to them, Come and you will see. Come on, I'll show you where I'm staying. So they came and they saw, and they were staying with him. And they stayed with him for that day, and it was, for, it was about the tenth hour. John gives us all the hour marks in Roman time, so this means it's 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, John, one of the, one of the brothers, uh, the two who goes, that John is speaking of here, that followed John, was Andrew. That's Simon Peter's brother. And so, verse 41, Andrew leaves after he finds out what Jesus is, and he says, he says we found his, he found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. We found the, the one who's called the Christ. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is Greek. We found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and says, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. It's not really a name change. Simon in Hebrew means chip off the rock. Cephas in Aramaic means chip off the rock. Peter in Greek means, guess what? Chip off the rock. He just says, for, from now on, because we're going to be dealing with Aramaic people, we're not going to use your Hebrew name. We're going to use your Aramaic name of Cephas. Well, they go on, and, and, and Andrew and Peter are from Bethsaida. Bethsaida. They go on down, it says in verse 30, 43, it says, the next day he purposed to go to Galilee. John is good about this. He tells us when he's going to go to Galilee, even though he didn't really cover the Galilean ministry. He just tells us when he goes, and he tells us when he comes back, and that's how we fill in the gaps. And he, and he found Philip, and he said to Philip, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida too. Philip knew John, Andrew and, and Peter, Andrew and, and, and Simon or Cephas and Peter. He knew them. They grew up in the same town. So Peter follows him, and then Peter, I mean, Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. And he said, Nathaniel, we have found the one who Moses in the law and in the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel. Nathaniel evidently was a godly man and a scholar of the Mosaic Law and of the prophets because Philip says, we found the one you're looking for. We found the one who's written out in the scriptures. We found the prophets, the one Moses talked about. By the way, Paul uses that same reference in his testimony all the time about Moses and the prophets. He says, we found him. And Nathaniel says, he's from Nazareth. There in verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip is from Cana. Just a little town, just a short distance from Nazareth. So either one of two things is, either Nazareth had a bad reputation, or Cana had, uh, or, or uh, Nazareth and Cana had a real um, uh, rivalry going on, which happened in those towns because of marketing and trading. So Philip said to him, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Jesus looked into his heart. And he knew that he was a man of God. Philip has already told us that he studied the law and the prophets and he's looking for the Messiah. He says, I found him. Come on and bring, he brings him to him. The, this, this bringing to is happening here. 
And Nathanael, verse 48, said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree, and I saw you. And Nathanael just bottoms out. Look at him, and he just goes, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said to him, Wait a minute. Because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you, you believe? Well, because you believe that easy that I am who I am and you know that I am the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophets. You will see greater things than these. And so in 51, he gives him a promise and he said to him, truly, truly. The word truly, truly is a Hebraism. Uh, We say it like this, amen, amen. It means exactly the same thing. The words mean firm and faithful. We have to use two words to describe what that word means. It means firm and faithful. John always says, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you do this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke only say truly. They don't double it because it still means firm and faithful. John puts the emphasis on it. We don't know if Jesus used it that way. But when Jesus says, truly, truly, or firm and faithful, I say to you, you will see heaven op- heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You're going to see great things, Nathaniel. And if Nathaniel really knew Moses, he knew the story of Jacob and his dream when heaven opened and the angels came down and Jacob wrestled with God all night. And if Nathaniel really knew the prophets, he knew about Daniel talking about heaven being opened and what happened in that. So Jesus returns to him and says and, and, and agrees that Dan, Nathaniel knows the, what Moses has written and he, he knows what Daniel has written. And if Nathanael was not at the baptism of Jesus when heaven opened up and poured down on Jesus, it doesn't matter because Nathanael is going to see the great things that the Lord is going to do when all of heaven is opened up and is poured out. That's the end of chapter 1. We'll pick up with chapter 2 when we return next week. Father, thank you so much for opening this wonderful gospel and giving John the ability to write this even 60 years after it all transpired, to fill in the holes for us so we will know in the story about your ministry here on earth. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus, in everything we do. May we learn and may we gain insight into what you want us to know for our lives through this study. In your son's name, amen.